Coming up, how the internet is governed. In my opinion, the stability of the internet should rank among other collective action problems that involve the world. American University professor Laura Donardis discusses domain names, privacy policies, and security on the web. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Our speaker is Laura Donardis, who will be discussing her recently published book entitled The Global War for Internet Governance. The rapid growth of the internet and the risks and rewards this brings are moving issues of cybersecurity and internet governance Drawing on over two decades of experience as both engineer and scholar of science and technology, Professor Denardis has been able to seamlessly weave together different aspects of technology and policy. So I think what I'd like to do today is to go through some examples of how the internet is already governed, and then maybe raise a few issues, some of the debates that are going on around the world and what might be at stake. I always like to start with this issue. It's the most technical issue, so if you'll allow me to start there, I, I would like to. It's the management of critical internet resources, which usually is a term to describe domain names, like cnn.com, for example, or american.edu, or lauradinartist.org. These are, have to be globally unique. And also internet addresses, which are numbers, binary numbers, which just means a series of zeros and ones that is necessary in order to send or receive information on the internet similar to the postal system. We have a unique address, and that's how people find us. Except it's not physical. It's virtual. It happens um, in the computer systems. And it's logical in nature. So what's political about this? It's a technical area. But the global struggle over who controls internet names and numbers has actually been a very long-standing issue. Power struggles have reflected tensions over new global institutions and their role, like ICANN, for example. Um, as well as the private companies that are involved in the governance. And a, a key feature is that the Department of Commerce in the United States has retained a historic relationship with this function uh, through having a contract with a function within this organization, ICANN, which I'll say a little bit more about in a minute, and also by having authority to update some of the um, technical functions that are involved in translating the names that we understand when we type in CNN.com and the numbers that a computer understands when it's routing information around the world. So what is ICANN? I'll say a word about that. It's a private nonprofit organization. It's incorporated in California. And it has oversight of names and numbers. Uh, so it, it controls the distribution of, ultimately, it has oversight over the distribution of these numbers. Although it's further allocated to regional internet registries around the world that further allocate the addresses. There are also a lot of private companies that take care of the mapping between names and numbers. They're called registries. If, you've, if you saw the GoDaddy advertisement, have you heard of GoDaddy? Danica Patrick is, is one of the yes. spokespeople for that. They're called a domain name registrar that hands out domain names. So there's a, there are a lot of institutions. This is just one small area of internet governance. But you can get a sense of all of the different entities that are involved in the management. So what, um, what are some of the political implications of this area? Because it is highly technical, and it's a little bit esoteric. Who should be able to use United.com, United Airlines, United Arab Emirates? And who decides? Well, this institutional system does decide. Another example of how this is very political is the authorization of what are called new top-level domains. So what's a top-level domain? That's an area of naming on the internet, such as .com, .edu. You're familiar with all of these. .gov. When you type in a domain name, you sometimes type in those various just suffixes, really, that represent an area of organization of naming on the internet. So who authorizes the development of new top-level domains? It's this institution, ICANN. And What's controversial about that? Well, can dot triple X be authorized or dot sex be authorized? Um, there are freedom of expression issues. There are issues of uh, public interest and child protection and law enforcement that come up in that. And really just interesting conflicts that can arise, for example, between a private company and a territorial entity like a government or a region. So recently, someone proposed well, I'd like to manage .amazon, and not surprisingly, it's the company Amazon. 
Well, the countries that have the Amazon rainforest within their borders said, wait a minute, right? There was a controversy over Dot Patagonia for the same reason. So these things, um, I could actually go on for hours and hours and hours about the conflicts in that area. And then, uh, of course, cybersecurity governance, that's an important area as well. Uh, beginning in, the in 1988 with the Morris worm, which took down an approximate 10% uh, of the internet. I was actually at Cornell at the time as a graduate student, and it originated uh, from another Cornell graduate student who was in my building, just kind of an interesting um, history for me, it really got me interested in cybersecurity. It was a really big deal at the time, and it drew it public attention and policymaker attention into the area of cybersecurity. But fast forward to today, and uh, attacks have gotten a lot more sophisticated, and we have Stuxnet, which was um, used to uh, take down Iranian. I don't know the particular details, and no one really knows all the details in the public, but to uh, take down Iranian nuclear facilities or a certain aspect of that. Now, who is responsible for cybersecurity governance? This is an area that is both public and private. The private sector really does handle a lot of security, but there are also private public institutions like computer emergency response teams. Then there's the issue of interconnection. Everyone in this room knows that the internet is not a cloud. When we sometimes talk about it with students, we draw a cloud. That doesn't make any sense. I don't know why we do that, because it's not actually a cloud. It has a physical architecture. It has transmission facilities and switches. Uh, it has equipment that's housed in buildings with a Coke machine and raised flooring and air conditioning and people and people. And the internet is made up of interconnected networks. It's not one network. It's a series of networks, um, most of them private networks, that make agreements to connect and to conjoin either bilaterally with each other or at shared internet exchange points. So this is um, a very important area of internet oversight because it, um, it involves a lot of coordination and it typically exists outside of um, government view and inspection. It's, it's, it's mostly a private area, but it determines the physical infrastructure and the virtual infrastructure of the internet. So I enjoy that area as well. Now here's one that you'll know about. The policy role of I'll just use the word that I normally, the term that I normally use, of private information intermediaries. That's just a fancy way of saying Facebook, like social media companies, search engines, like Angie's List, and Yelp, and Rate My Professor, which is one I like to go to. These are rating systems. They're search engines. They're social media, information aggregation sites like YouTube and like um, Flickr. These are not providing content, but they facilitate the sharing of content. And most of them provide free services and make money through systems of online advertising. But all of them establish public policy. You can think about um, many examples of this. One that I write about in the book is uh, constantly changing privacy policies of social media. And I have my students read all of the privacy policies every semester, because often we just say, we just check and say, I agree. But it is really interesting when you uh, read those. They make decisions about hate speech and what should be removed, about cyberbullying. They are on the front lines of um, intellectual property rights enforcement, like uh, copyright and trademark issues. So all of them do establish policy. They're enacting governance. There are many taxonomies for understanding the functions of internet governance. This is just the one that I like to use, the issues that I mentioned. And then one other. It is the, um, the issue of the relationship between internet infrastructure and intellectual property rights enforcement. Traditional online enforcement by um, protecting copyright by going after a person or by going after the content itself sometimes does not work in the digital environment. So there has been a movement to have internet service providers have something called three strikes approaches that can cut off access. There has been um, a notice and takedown procedure on YouTube. It's a very complicated area, but think about a time when you've been to YouTube and you've seen this video has been taken down because of a copyright violation. Google has some obligation to, to take it down under this uh, notice and takedown, and in exchange for that, they have immunity from liability 
for uh, copyright infringement that occurs on their site. So this is a very, um, very interesting area. My book addresses what is at stake in all of these areas. Um, I find it incredibly fascinating. And I can't get into all the issues, but what I wanted to do is provide some common themes among all of those. The first theme among all of these examples is that arrangements of technical architecture are also arrangements of power in modern society. I've mentioned that the complex institutional and technical scaffolding is somewhat behind the scenes. But nevertheless, they embed political and cultural concerns. The second theme is that internet governance infrastructure, the technologies, the architecture, the infrastructure, is increasingly becoming a proxy for broader political struggles and for control of content. Nation states around the world, and this is a global issue, internet governance is a global issue, they've lost control over content. Repressive governments want to suppress the media. They want to censor information. They have to turn now to technical infrastructure to do that. Media companies have lost control of the monetization of their own content to a certain extent because of piracy. So they're turning to infrastructure to do that. And then another theme is this um, issue of the privatization of internet governance, the privatization of governance. So we have technologies that transcend borders. We have private companies that manage a lot of aspects of these technologies. But that's not all. It's not only private. Governments perform antitrust. Governments, um, you want the government to come to your aid if you've been the victim of identity theft. They respond to internet security threats. They enforce child protection measures. They enact privacy laws. But most of the functions of internet governance that I mentioned, on the front lines at least, that is the purview of private industry. So private companies manage the mapping of names into numbers. They make up the majority of the internet's backbone. They set standards for the internet. And they're carrying out these core functions, not only in these functions, but also as actors that are forced to respond to political events on a global stage. There's delegated censorship, where a country asks a private company to take down information. They ask search engines to remove links. They approach social media platforms to delete defamatory material. And as we know, they approach internet service providers and social media companies to turn over information about individuals for national security or law enforcement or other uh, political reasons. So what do we have here? We have delegated surveillance, delegated censorship, delegated copyright enforcement, delegated law enforcement in general. It has shifted governance, for better or worse, to the private sector, which creates challenging issues for the private sector that's forced to deal not with one government, but with 100 governments making requests in different legal structures, in different political contexts, and with different norms. So that's a challenging role to play. But the bottom line is that much of internet governance does either originate in the private sector or is delegated um, to these private entities from governments. What I would like to do is to highlight uh, a few of what I see as some specific challenges to internet governance and some of the debates that are going on now around the world. One has to do with the possibility of internet fragmentation. We think of the internet as being one network. Although you could easily argue that we don't have a universal internet now, because if you're looking at the internet and English is not your first language, it looks completely different to you than if English is your first language. There are digital divide issues. Uh, there are systems of filtering and censorship. So there, you, you could argue that we don't have a universal internet. But at the technical level, we have the building blocks of a universal internet. And we have a great, de great degree of technical universality. Well, I'm concerned about internet fragmentation. And th this can be a very technical issue. But the easiest way to understand it is through a lens of something political, like the Snowden NSA disclosures. There have been a lot of reactions to this, such as um, what were some of the initial reactions? Wanting to route around the United States, wanting to bypass internet exchange points that are in the United States, walling off internet services to try to stay within a country. 
either in cloud computing services or applications. Um, there was an initial call in Brazil, as I understand it, to store Brazilian customer data within the Brazil borders. Some German telecommunication companies initially suggested walling off the internet in a way that could stop the NSA surveillance. So you see these kinds of proposals, including cloud computing proposals, and it raises the question of whether we'll have a universal internet or whether we'll move to a more fragmented environment. And I raise this as a very real issue because it's not, we, as I mentioned before, it was a very difficult move to go from lack of interoperability to having interoperability. So I'm very concerned when I hear about um, proposals that would fragment the internet. A closely related challenge is the question of, I'm gonna use two strange words, whether we're going to continue to have multi-stakeholder internet governance, multi-stakeholder internet governance versus um, multilateral internet governance. Right now there are layers upon layers of internet governance functions. Some are done by these new institutions like ICANN. Some, as I mentioned, are the purview of government. Some are done by private industry. Some are done by all and are, are multi-stakeholder. But if you look at this in its entirety, that's called multi-stakeholder governance and it, what, it's what keeps the internet running. Well, there are uh, also concerns and proposals, um, not just in response to the Snowden issue, but other things in the world, to have greater government regulation of the internet in a variety of different areas. And it's very important to pause before having greater regulation because it's really not that, in, that um, easy. The engineering is really not that easy to keep things running. And so the question has to be asked not whether there needs to be more government oversight of internet governance as if it's one thing, but looking at specific areas and seeing you know, what is the problem that folks need, or think needs addressing. So what is the problem in the area of surveillance or in privacy or in standard setting? What, what exactly is the problem to which these proposals are responding is um, what I like to say. So there are a number of issues, open issues to watch in the coming years. The truth is that right now the internet is governed. This governance has been in a constant state of flux for decades. It's a very powerful area of authority because we have the technical mediation of the public sphere. So democracy takes place online. And then we have the privatization in some sense of the conditions of civil liberties within that public sphere. So the governance is not fixed any more than architecture is fixed. It's constantly changing. Um, it, makes, um, it makes me uncomfortable, but also excited about it. So this is an important issue. In my opinion, the stability of the internet should rank among other collective action problems that involve the world, like environmental protection, human rights, and basic infrastructural systems of water and energy. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to speak here today about this because um, public engagement in the issues is critical considering what's at stake. So thank you very much for listening and I'm very much looking forward to the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you. Wondering if you could expand a little bit on the privacy aspects of it. Uh, people in different countries have different relationships with their government in terms of what privacy is protected. And if you're talking about international internet, where are those privacy controls as more of our lives are going online, um, how that relates in, for people in America versus anywhere else. Right. Um, every, every government and region has a different approach to privacy and there are different norms, even when law doesn't address it, to privacy. So for example, in the European Union, there are very strong privacy protections. And sometimes that is more of a cultural norm than freedom of expression. So protecting the individual, it's called you know, the right to delete. Um, the right to delete yourself from the internet is very, very important culturally. And it's enshrined in law to a, to a certain extent. In the US, it's a very different environment where freedom of expression is a value that is uh, privileged in some ways over other values. So it varies from country to country. And this presents um, a complex dilemma because businesses that do their business in all of these different regions and countries have to figure out how to do that. It's the same thing I would add with censorship and with what information is allowed to be online and what isn't. 
So for example, in parts of the world, it's not OK, um, if I'm stating this correctly, to, to sell Mein Kampf, I believe, or to deny the Holocaust. In other countries, hate speech is opposed by the full force of the law. In other countries, in, including in the United States, we have the right to say some really, I, I'm not, we're being videotaped right now, so I won't say some of the things that are privileged over that would be illegal in other countries. But it's, uh, it's very malleable. So you have all of these different laws. And then you also have norms having nothing to do with the law, where different platforms have different norms about how to manage uh, content and the privacy of individuals. Are we allowed to have anonymity in a platform? That's platform specific. Do we need a real name identification? Do we have options to turn off the gathering of data about us, like our location based on the iPhone, our phone number? If you read, I would encourage everyone to go back and read the privacy policy of the social media application you use the most, whether Twitter or Facebook, WhatsApp, or any of these, and see the types of information that is gathered about us. So a lot of that happens in the platform, as well as having the regional and national differences. My name is Eduardo Ulibarri, I'm ambassador of Costa Rica to the UN. My question is whether you foresee some sort of ideal way of governing internet, especially to the future, so that it could be technically feasible, that it could be sustainable, and that could be open, as it has been so far, to the changes that might occur in the, in the future. My personal opinion is that the way that the universal internet should be governed is through multi-stakeholder governance. If, um, if you think about internet governance the way I do, and there are many other ways to think about it, I include the design of technology, the administration of critical internet resources, the, uh, every, all kinds of public policy issues ra ranging from the protection of children to privacy to um, defamation, all, a whole host of issues. I think that the, the reason that the internet has been successful has been because it hasn't been developed by governments. It's been developed by the private sector in cooperation and sometimes with funding of governments. And then the ecosystem of internet governance that has um, arisen over time has been um, multi-stakeholder where, and again, depending on which area we're discussing, there's input of civil society Citizens are engaged in some way. You can raise the question of how can citizens be meaningfully engaged. But I think we saw with the SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act example, that citizens can make a difference. And then having private sector lead in certain areas. So I, I think that keeping a balance of powers is the best way to preserve the stability of the internet. So uh, that's, uh, again, though, it depends on what area of internet governance we're talking about. And, um, you know, the, the big question for the world is, what does multi-stakeholder governance look like in each of these areas? It's, it's a very big question. And then how do you provide legitimacy in the different areas and get input and uh, have adequate transparency where necessary? So really, that's, that's the crux of the difficult question in internet governance, is what's the balance of powers in any one particular area? I have to ask you the question that your students must ask you after you've made them read all those privacy policies. What do we do with this information that we've just obtained? We learn that they are sweeping up all this stuff and we're supposedly agreeing to let them uh, sweep it all up. What, what can we do? Can we not click and uh, refuse to accept it and then plan to negotiate with them on a better privacy policy? I think individuals don't have very much power at all to push back against uh, privacy because what we used to, to hear is, well, just don't use that. But now, in order to participate in social life and economic life and political life, we need to use platforms. Many of them have the same types of privacy issues. What's the limit? What's the limit of the data that can be collected? I think we're almost at the point where we don't have the option of, of reasonable anonymity online, but we're not there yet. In parts of the world, there are real name identification requirements to use a cyber cafe. Countries are talking about having a real name identification, like use your ID to get online. Right? We can stop those types of things and provide for the possibility of anonymity. But I feel like the best that we can do is to have traceable anonymity, where data is gathered about us, 
and law enforcement can request it with a judicial order, you know, with some kind of due process and having a system where there are uh, constraints and checks and balances. I think that's the best that we can do at this point. Why is all that data gathered about us, by the way? The reason all that data is gathered about us is because of the Faustian bargain that we've made. We use everything for free. I use free email, I use free search, I use free social media, I use free information aggregation devices. But it's not that money is not changing hands. There's an enormous amount of money changing hands. It's online advertising. So because of that system of online advertising that is the business model that provides all this great access to knowledge, that's why the information is gathered. That's why governments can come in and request that information. I think part of the solution is and some of these efforts that are being undertaken in, in the private sector in um, cooperation with civil society to say, well, what does corporate social responsibility mean and what kind of user choice can there be? Very complicated area. Um, I think that uh, I should have some right to turn off some of the tracking. That's my personal opinion, and I know a lot of people agree with me. But on the other hand, I do realize that the business models depend upon a certain amount of data gathering. I have to thank you for really introducing us to this very complicated topic. Thank you very much. Please continue the conversation. Thank you. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.